Hey YouTube, this is Praxis Prepper. Do you get the impression, listening to World Events right now, that as preppers we should probably start paying just, just a little attention to our nuclear preparedness skills? You know, just kind of boning up there a little bit. I know I have. I don't feel any immediate existential threats at the moment, but I feel it's prudent to start doing a little bit of homework now so you don't get to the back of the line later. Um, I've been doing a lot of reading in books, uh, research online, also you know trying to find informative YouTube uh, videos on the topic. And I know for myself, I've had a lot of trouble. Uh, you, YouTube, for example, a lot of the, the times there'll be a little thumbnail. It always has a mushroom cloud on it, and it'll say something like "surviving how to survive nuclear war." You click on it, and you get something like this. Good morning, YouTube. Uh, I was on Yahoo this morning, getting my morning news. Man, the writing's on the wall. We're going to war with Russia. Nuclear war with Russia. Um, it's definitely happening. I'm not going to go into any information that I have uh, on it. Wow, that was so helpful. Now I'm both scared and angry. Let's see what else I can find. I'm sure that there is a lot still applicable from those old 1950s films, but honestly, um, weapons have advanced so far. I think that uh, watching one of those old videos is probably a, about the same as trying to figure out how to survive in a modern gang warfare environment by watching West Side Story. Great, Daddy O. So listen, everybody dress up sweet and sharp. Me Tony me at the dance at the 10. And walk tall! We always walk tall! We're Jets! The greatest! But what about books? Well, let's delve into the Nuclear, Biological, and Chemical Survival Manual, as I don my completely unnecessary reading glasses, and, uh, and see if that's any better. Let's see, what do we have in here? We'll start right from the beginning. Uh, something about terrorism. The World Trade Center was bombed. These people, terrorists. More about terrorists. Ah, Al-Qaeda. Catastrophic terrorism. Let's see chapter two. Ah, and in bold print, the threat is growing. <laughs> and some of us are just plain lazy. I'll do it tomorrow. Chapter three, a brief history. Mustard gas, chlorine gas, the Black Death during the French and Indian War. Chlorine was not the only toxic chemical employed during World War I. By the summer of 1917, by 1945, oh, that 1990s Saddam Hussein. And that brings us to chapter four. And we haven't talked about anything yet, really. Before we dump right into the topic of nuclear war disaster, I wanted to talk about a very important tool that I think is critical both for that and, unfortunately, for sort of daily life now. Uh, you probably remember back in 2011, the Fukushima power plant in Japan had an exceptionally bad day uh, and uh, has had a number of bad days since then. Uh, they were dumping a lot, and still are to my knowledge, dumping a lot of radioactive material into the Pacific Ocean, which is a large body of water, but um, radioactive material, even in small quantities, is, you know, not something you want to have in your food supply. Um, I am mostly vegetarian, but I do occasionally eat fish, maybe two or three times a month. I'll have some either sardines or salmon. Um, so I wanted to make sure that those healthy fish, you know, all those healthy little fish oils, uh, that those healthy fish continue to be healthy. Uh, so I bought a Geiger counter. This is a radiation alert inspector. Uh, I think I paid a few hundred bucks for it uh, back a few years ago. It runs on 9 volt batteries and I run this off of rechargeable 9 volt batteries. Um, so that's always nice. Uh, and mine has a, a test plate. The nice thing about this, I mean any Geiger counter you get, you're going to be able to turn on and it'll start clicking. Uh, there's, well, there's background radiation everywhere. so. Um, they're all going to do that, but what's nice about this, and a lot of other models as well, of course, uh, is that it can do a timed count. Uh, and the reason that's good is the same reason that it's good to have a large sample set when you're doing, say, presidential polling. Uh, you're, if you just talk to a very narrow group of people, your, um, uh, your results are going to potentially be much more skewed than if you have a, a very large uh, um, sample set. Using this, uh, I've been able to chart a lot of data points uh, over the past few years about some fish that uh, have come out of the ocean. I'm going to share those with you right now. 
Uh, one thing that's very important to do is to find out your background radiation level first. And I've taken a number of background radiation tests, and that's just having the test plate be empty, sliding it in, and I do a 20-minute timed count. You could do it longer. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing it shorter. Um, uh, and for me here, at my altitude, and given my surroundings, um, the background radiation over a 20-minute period hits this with about 800, 820 clicks per 20 minute period. That's just background radiation. What's coming from space, what's coming from you know, everything around me that, that emits radiation. Um, so it's important to know that so when you put a sample in there, you, you don't put it in and say, holy crap, 820 clicks off of this whatever, and then you find out, oh, well, it would have done the same thing if it was empty. So putting uh, a bit of sardine in here uh, a couple of years ago, uh, back in uh, 2014, no, yeah, 2014, um, what I was getting was slightly above background radiation, about 850 clicks per 20 minute period. So slightly above background radiation, um, but not significantly. And I've continued to test the sardines over that period, and I've watched a steady decline of the radiation levels, uh, which suggests to me that there was something, despite what the media was sort of saying, there was contamination in the ocean. It wasn't, it wasn't that much, um, but it was accumulated even in those low low on the food chain animals, the sardines. Um, and it's always better to stay low on the food chain for pollutants and things like that. That's one of the reasons that I am mostly vegetarian, because you know you don't get lower in the food chain than plants, except for Venus flytraps. They're, they're one step up. Do you ever feel like there's something wrong with plants eating animals? I know I do. Like, all the animal can even within the animal kingdom, it's like I feel like the higher life forms should eat the lower life forms. And I say that as a vegetarian, but it just bothers me like when an insect eats a frog. It's like, ah, oh, it's, it's nature upside down. Same with plants eating bugs and things like that. It just seems wrong. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, where was I? Oh, yeah. So, sardines slowly coming down in radioactivity. Um, I did test salmon the other day, and I apologize, I only have one data point on salmon. I know that's not cool, um, but I have one data point on salmon, and I'll share it with you. I know it would be better if I had more than one, because I could say, well, they used to be here, and then they're here, oh my goodness, or they used to be here, and now they're coming down, and that's good. Um, so, I'm sorry, I only have one. Um, salmon, the other day, over a 20-minute period, uh, clicked in at 890 clicks per 20 minute period. So higher than background and higher even than the, the sardines were. Um, sort of, I don't know whether that was their peak because I, I, I didn't chart the whole thing, but even when the sardines were higher, you know, the salmon was even higher than them. But that's sort of to be expected. Salmon are higher on the food chain, so they're going to accumulate more of that kind of stuff. So that's not necessarily a surprise. Um, but the thing is, is that Whatever decision you decide to make with the data that you collect from this, um, you can at least make an informed decision. Otherwise, radiation is invisible, you can't see it, and the only other uh, evidence you have that you're being exposed to it is that you know, you're spitting up blood and that your hair is falling out. So um, this is much better, you know, just getting a number is much more pleasant than you know, pulling out chunks of hair and being like, oh, geez, I, I guess we've been exposed to something. Um, so if you are thinking about getting one of these, I know I said it was a couple hundred bucks that I spent on it. Um, I guarantee if there is a panic, and the way geopolitics are going, there may be a panic coming up, um, these are going to get a lot more expensive. So if you're thinking about it, now might be the good time to do it. So I would highly recommend this unit, or at least getting something so you have some way of measuring uh, what's around you, because otherwise you're really completely blind, both uh, in terms of, like I said, you know, seafood um, uh, from the Pacific Ocean at the moment, or, God forbid, this incredibly, ridiculously horrifying prospect of actual confrontation with Russia that could go nuclear, which would totally suck walls. But it could also happen, so, you know, it's prudent for us to talk about it. So let's talk about it. So beginning next week, I'm going to start the first installment of my Nuclear War Survival uh, Strategy series. Um, it is going to be a distillation of the, the useful information from books like this and uh, web resources. Just last night I was reading in this book uh, useful information too. It's, it's not that there's not good information in these books, uh, it's just that it's fluffed up into this giant thing so they can sell it as like a big book. So I'm going to be distilling just the information, you know, where's the beef? Well, as, a, as a vegetarian, should I be like 
Where, where's the tofu? Where's the tofu? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> One piece of tofu that I found in here uh, just last night was uh, a very clear uh, description, uh, and I'll be sharing this more in detail with you next week, but the, about the fact that the depending on the altitude of an explosion, uh, the effects of it can be very different. And obviously, that's true, you know, in terms of physical damage and, and everything, but also in terms of fallout. If something explodes right on the ground and the fireball consumes the ground, there's an enormous amount of local fallout. Uh, if it's really high in elevation, there's not nearly as much of a fallout concern. So that's one piece of information I've already gleaned from this. I'll be sharing more with you next week. Again, just the tofu, bringing you just the facts that you need to know and not a bunch of rambling on like I'm doing right now. I'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.